Hi, it's Kernel Tech here again with the next in a series of videos about installing Linux from scratch 10.0 on a Raspberry Pi 400. So, um, since the last video, we've installed um, some initial tools for the tool chain, um, and now what's going to happen is that we're going to enter the truth and build some additional temporary tools within the truth. So this kind of indicates that the tool chain is almost in a prepared state to build the final system. As you can see from the list of tools on the screen, they're only um, kind of like applications. Maybe the only one that isn't a application that's needed for the rest of the build is the lib standard C++ library from GCC, which is the first to be built. Um, but after that, at the end of this section, we'll have a complete environment ready to build the final Linux from scratch system. So, um, just a word of warning, I, I didn't really think about this at the time. Um, I've come to turn the Raspberry Pi on this morning and it wouldn't boot. And the reason was because I'd put the um, uh, Linux from scratch hard disk um, into the FS tab file so it was booting and I didn't have the external drive plugged in um, so it was causing it to hang. I was initially getting a black screen and then I got a message saying that um, partition couldn't be found and that's what it was. That's when I, the penny dropped and I realised what was going on. So um, yeah, once I've rebooted it with the external drive plugged in then it um, obviously worked and you can see there there's the SDA3 that I've got um, under MNT LFS and if you remember the FS tab I'd added in not only the partition for the new Linux from scratch system but also I cre I'd created a swap file on that drive and um, put that into the FS tab so I'm going to have to remember to deactivate that uh, those two lines um, when I've finished to ensure that I don't have the same problem again. So if I do swap on, um, oh actually that's interesting, the swap file has been activated this time. Um, although it's got a lower priority so it shouldn't be used, but I'm going to deactivate it anyway just to be sure that it doesn't get used. Um, as I said in previous videos, it's uh, it's a lot slower as it's on the SD card and it's also uh, marginally slower because it's a file rather than the partition. It's got to go through the file system, any, any reads and writes. It's got to go through the file system, which that swap file is residing on, which will be probably an ext4. Um, if it's a partition, then the kernel just talks directly to the um, sectors on, on within that partition so it's a lot more direct and less, less overhead. It's marginal, it won't be much but um, it's, it's still there, it's still real. Okay so I've got everything set up, uh, set up as I want it to, yeah so I can now become root again and carry on with the actual building. So this is at chapter 7 we're starting with today. So as it says here, I've, I've just mentioned it, it shows how to build the last missing bits of the temporary system. Um, first the tools that needed to buy the build machinery of various packages and then three packages need to run the test. So let's just go back and look at those. So the last three that are needed to run the test, Python, text info and util Linux. So Perl, Bison, get text and lib, lib standard are all actually required to do the building. So I guess if you tight for time or you decided you, you weren't going to be testing, you could theoretically skip Python, text info and util Linux. Um, I personally wouldn't recommend it. I'd build them in and run the tests. Um, now that all the circular dependencies have been resolved, we can use a true environment completely isolated 
completely that should be completely isolating the host operating system used for the build except for the running kernel so um, I hope you can see that that's that's what we want we don't want to have any reliance whatsoever on the Raspberry Pi operating system we want to have our own self-contained um, system or at least minimal system can, can put, uh, uh, consisting that's the word I was looking for consisting of uh, the tools the binaries required to build and the libraries required to build um, the final system um, for the proper operation of an isolated environment some communication with the running kernel must be established this is done through so called virtual kernel file systems so it's things like proc and sys directories which need to be mount um, and as it says until the entering truth the commands must be run as root with the LFS variable set and then after in the truth there's no need for the LF, LFS variable because we will effectively be be in the new Linux from scratch truth um, hopefully that makes sense if it doesn't already when we, when we go in there and as before it says to be careful um, because any badly formed commands or if you've not got LFS set then you could trash the system that you have the host system that um, you're running to build Linux from scratch so maybe we should just check that we have actually got LFS set we have so that was obviously set in the bash profile for root which is a good thing so let's move on then so we've got here a couple of commands first one's to create some basic uh, sorry to change the ownership of the basic directories that were created right at the very beginning they're owned by the LFS user so we're now taking ownership as the root of these files and then the last command was well, actually three three lines um, to this command it's checking to see if it's a 64-bit processor well yeah 64-bit processor but it's sorry it's the operating system it's checking when we're, we're not on the 64-bit um, operating system so this will have no effect if you do decide to put that in on the 32-bit so preparing virtual kernel file systems so let's make some directories where the um, virtual file systems reside and then a couple of device nodes that are required early on at boot that must exist all the other these all the device files used to be created manually in a similar way to what we've done with this console and null device node um, but since the udev library has been around um, these um, devices are created on the fly um, mostly at boot time but if you for example to play uh, plug in a, a USB device while the system's running and it it produces a you know there's a driver running and it produces a device device node it will automatically be created so they're, they're virtual these two obviously real files they exist in the file system because we've just created them but udev takes control of the rest of the dev tree and creates its own virtual virtual device nodes and what we're going to do now with this command is to mount the current dev directory so if I just have a quick look at that so that directory there what this command does it it attaches the dev directory in the LFS hierarchy so if we look at that you see this is one of the directories we've just created and th there's those two files it attaches the system the host dev directory onto the MNT LFS dev directory and in doing so incidentally it will mask these two files but they're there for the first time we boot the new system so if I now do that command there where we where before we had console and null we're now going to have an exact image uh, an exact copy it's like a shadow copy if you like a ghost image of the system so that means if the system were to create a device node because we plugged something into the Raspberry Pi 
that would appear in the LFS as well because it's it's shadowing it. And likewise, we do similar commands for the other virtual file systems. So there's one for PTS, which is a directory in, within dev. There's proc, sys, and run. So now we've got all these virtual file systems mounted. And if you were to stop, from now on, if you were to stop um, building Linux from scratch halfway through the process and you were to shut down the Raspberry Pi, you'd have to come back and remount these directories. So you'd have to run this command and all these commands again um, before you enter the true environment and to carry on building. So it's important to know. Um, this is important on the Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm pretty sure this does something. Oh, it doesn't. No, it must be another command. So it's not, not important. Ignore what I just said. Um, but it's worth running anyway in case maybe something else has created this, this link. Um, so, yeah, just run it anyway. Um, if, if, if it needs to execute, it will do it. It does a little test there, so it knows whether to, to do anything or not. Now, entering the truth environment. So, this is the command. And normally, we just copy this in and... Whereas we'd have the um, Raspberry Pi system, the root looking like that. When, when we enter the true environment, we'll have a different looking root file system because that will be the new um, LFS system that we've created. And the true basically says the root of the file system, the root of this system is now going to be located at this directory. Make, it, make that directory look like the, the root of this system. And that's all it does. Now, because we had some C flags set um, to ensure that the compiler um, uses the correct features of the processor, and in particular to ensure that it's using the hard floating point hardware, um, what I'm going to do is copy part of this command up to here and add in those environment variables and that means that whenever we run the truth those environment variables will be activated um, could in theory add them to the bash profile um, I guess could do it I suppose uh, it, it doesn't matter either way uh, it's, it's I suppose good to, to do here because we've got currently other temporary variables so uh, well not temporary but they're variables that um, are here just for the environment that we're in at the moment. So what I'm going to do first of all is just display the um, contents of the uh, LFS users bash profile because that's where we had that no, wasn't it? it was a bash RC because the profile read that I think. Oh, it's just bash RC, that's right. Type, right, that's it. So now I can basically paste this in, paste this command in. It's incomplete because we've got a backslash at the end. And all we need to do is just copy that command or that line in. Put a backslash on in a space, backslash. Space is just to format it nicely on the screen, copy that command in as well, space backslash and finally we'll copy the make flags as well to ensure that we're building using all four cores. So again space backslash on the end, press enter, we've still got the little prompt saying it's waiting for more input so all we need to do is copy the last important line which starts the bell, uh, the bash shell processor And right, okay, I did that wrong, didn't I? We don't need to put the export in because that's a command and all we're doing is setting variables. So we've just got to delete the export in front of the C flags. Export in front of the CXX flags and export 
that's in front of the make flags. That's better. And you can see now we've got a prompt that says LFS truth to warn us that we're in the true environment, the real environment. You can see that's come from this uh, prompt string LFS truth. And I have no name, which is explained in the book um, somewhere. Yeah, down here. Uh, it's because the etc password file has not been created. That would have the root's name in it. Um, and because it's not been created, that's why it's complaining that the current user, the current, which is root, has got no name because it can't locate a name for it. Um, it does actually say here, I didn't know, I've never noticed this before, that if other variables desired, such as C flags, or CXS flags, this is a good place to set them again. So it's it's the right thing to do to set them here at the moment, and then maybe at another time when it's more appropriate to set those C flags and CXX flags actually in a um, bash startup file. And it explains the uh, uh, reasons for the other um, environment variables as well. Uh, now note here it says it's important that all commands throughout the range of this chapter following chapters are run within the true environment so that's important because we're now in our environment that we've created up till now um, and we want no interference from the host at all so it's all, all everything's got to be compiled from within, within this environment to ensure that the host um, hasn't interfered with the new system if you don't do that you'll get files linked against the host and when you boot the new system it will just break because the host won't exist and you know things won't work basically and as it says here that um, if you do stop if you leave the environment for any reason for example rebooting or you know you finish up for the end of the day um, to um, remount the virtual file systems and then enter the truth again before continuing so that's what I mentioned before Okay, so let's move on. So if I just show you before I move on first, uh, the current route, you can see it's a lot different to what it looked like. There's fewer, fi fewer files. There's probably about a dozen lines there. If I scroll back, there's way more on the actual host, which is what you'd expect. So you can see I've done an ls-l on the route. Fewer files because this is a route. And you can see a lot of these are empty. There's um, no numbers in any of these. Oh, sorry, that's the roots. These are all two. These are empty ones here. So this is the user and group. And because, there's, again, there's no password file, um, it's using the default um, user ID and group ID. And, of course, because it's root, it's created these. Owned by root. Group is you, root. Root is always zero. So that's why that's there. And you can see that one there is 1001 because that was the user ID that was um, allocated by the Raspberry Pi system when we created the um, LFS user. So that's why that's 1001. Because we, we changed the ownership of the sources to, to the LFS so that it could access it, uh, that user could access it and um, read the sources. Okay, so let's carry on with creating the directories. So there's a few more important directories here. You can see Boots, one of them. Home, another important one. So I'll create those. And again, if I list, you can see that's grown now. It looks more like a normal root file system. And then there's a lot more subdirectories here. So there's a couple in etc, opt and sysconfig. There's a firmware directory for any firmware we might want to install, which resides under lib. Under the media, we've got floppy and CD-ROM. Well, possibly you wouldn't want floppy, but maybe that could be there to meet a, one of the particular standards that the LFS uh, team tried to meet. The other, the um, Linux standard base or the FHS file hierarchy system. So we're just uh, creating these subdirectories within the directories we've already created. And as I said before, I'll copy these one at a time 
just to make sure there's no errors on creation. There shouldn't be in theory. There shouldn't be, but you never know. So a couple of sim links. And then some special directories with special permissions. And again, it explains that there. And yes, so it mentions the FHS compliance there. So that could be why we've got um, floppy there, even though it's uh, old technology. Um, it may still be part of the standard. Um, it does also say that the only create directories that are needed, there are other directories in the, in the standard. So in theory, you could leave the floppy one out if you wanted to, based on what they do here. So creating essential files and sim links. So there's a few more things to add here. Basic host name is added to hosts. And then we create a default ETC password file. You can see the roots in there and then a couple of other system users. And then some default groups as well. And then this part, I don't know why they do it like this. Maybe it's because we're still in quite a basic environment or maybe the tools aren't available, but they create a tester user and group here for running some of the tests later on. So let's create these here now. And to, it says to remove that I have no name prompt, start a new shell. And since these password and group files have been created the username and group resolution will now work so this should get rid of the I have no name and there you go we've now got the root name come up which is correct and there's just one or two other little files that need to be created and all I do is to touch these to create the empty files change group ownership of that file and change the mode of it and change the mode of another file here okay so we can start by carrying on compiling so first thing we do is go into the sources directory extract the GCC tarball because as, as you see it says lib standard C++ from GCC so it's only a small part of the GCC package we're compiling here and it does actually say here as part of the GCC sources you should first unpack GCC tarball and change to the directory So just one thing I will do before um, I carry on is just to check that we've got the C flag set. Yep, and check CXX flags. Make sure those environment variables have been read. Right, that one hasn't. That's interesting. Okay, and I'll just check make flags while I'm here. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to come out of the true, so I'm going to do control D or you can type exit. And just recall the last command. And I think the reason why it's not worked is because of this line here. Normally that would work in a script because C flags would get allocated straight away. But this whole command, this is one command we've got here. So at the, because everything gets allocated at the same time, the environment variables get allocated at the same time this command is running, this part of the command or the assignments running assuming C flags it exists, well it doesn't at the moment because it's being defined in the same command so what we've got to do is just copy the C flags 
string and just paste that in there and now that will work so we go back into truth so if I now just check all of these environment variables again okay if I spell them correctly it, yep there's C flags yeah see so CXX flags is working now and just once again check make flags yep that's fine so let's go back to sources back to the GCC directory and we can start copying and pasting the commands in and start building up the remainder of the temporary tools and it's worth mentioning although you see me just copy and paste with a little bit of commentary as I go through um, spend time to read read the additional text that's around the comments because that, that's the way you'll really learn about Linux from scratch and I can assure you of some of these packages you will have time to to read what what they've got to say about the commands and switches and the reasons why they use them or what they're doing and so on and it is interesting and it'll all make sense and things start to come together yeah, it's a good, good, good bit of learning So some of these config commands are taking a little bit of time of notice. There's a little delay, and that's probably because this Pi has just been turned on, what, half an hour ago, maybe. Uh, nothing's cached, so as we go through, some of the programs that get used a lot will be cached and retained in memory, and things will work a little bit quicker. But at the moment, I can just detect that it's a little bit, it's not flowing as well as it was before. But yeah, it's just because it's first thing in the morning, it's just first fresh boot. Okay, so let's build this. I'm just going to time this out of interest. Uh, if we look at the um, build units, they're up in 0.8, so it's only going to take a couple of minutes in theory to build the whole package. So this make shouldn't take any more than that, really. I'll just get another tab up to monitor that all the cores are being used. Oops, I don't want to do that. Alright, let's trash that. Right, because of what's happened there, I'm going to start that all over again. interesting can't seem to get that to be the same what's as before now Have we got the truth there? Yes, we have. So I'll just go straight into this back to the sources, um, and I'm going to remove the GCC directory. I don't want to take any chances. Don't know what state that's in, having crashed out. Let's open up the new tab before I go any further. Okay, and I'll extract it again. Things should be a little bit quicker now. So I'm getting top up here. I'll usually press Z to get the color up. Just makes it a bit easier to see the numbers on the top. And one will show each core, how, how much each core is being used. I just wanted to see that they were actually being used during the compile. So I'll get back to the top here, run these commands in again. After we've changed into the GCC directory, 
So there's that one. Make a build directory. And in fact, I forgot about that. The build directory could have just deleted the contents of that and started again, but um, didn't think of that. It's because normally there's not a build directory, it's only tends to be these bigger packages. Right, so let's run the make again and just switch over to this other tab and yeah I can see the user and the system are totaling of roughly nearly 100% each so that's good and you can see we've used about half a gigabyte of memory in total at this moment in time. Um, yeah, you can see the cores here, that one's up to 100, that one's 40% as they jump around, so it is going well. So, so I'll just give this a minute or so to complete. Okay, it's done. You have two and a half minutes. Um, we can just run in make install as it's got at the bottom there. Just there, so. And it's all done, so we'll tidy that up. to the next one which is get text so a simple configure command
Okay, so let's configure that. I'm just to quite a while. So let's run the make.
Okay, that's built. Um, don't actually run the install for this package, I just copy the binaries that are needed to continue. So we'll do that, and that's finished. Tidy it up and move on to Bison. Got the configure command to run in. Okay, and now let's build a package. Let's make. That's nice and quick, and we can install it now. That's complete, so we'll tidy up. And move on to the next package, which is Pearl. So we've got quite a meaty Pearl configure command here.
Okay, that's configured. So as it says, we'll just run make to compile it. Okay, so that is built. We can install it now. And tidy it up. And now we move on to Python. 
Now one thing to bear about part bear in mind about parse and when you extract the package as in fact it says in the yellow note here is that the package name begins with a capital P. If you try to do it with a lowercase P or just get the documentation table. So that's worth bearing in mind. So Python, let's configure it. Okay, now we can run make. OK, that's complete. Uh, we can now install the package.
and we can now tidy up and move on to tax info so simple config command Configure's done, so we'll build it with make and then we'll be able to install it. Okay, let's install it now. So that's complete. Tied it up and move on to Util Linux. So this is the last package we build in the temporary or for the temporary system before we finally move on to building the real Linux from scratch system. So we need to create a directory looks of it. And we've got this big configure command. Okay, so that configures quite a bit of output there about the state of the configuration. Let's run make to build it.
Okay, that's built, so let's install it. All done, tidy up. And we can move on to the next part. So this bit is cleaning up and saving temporary systems. So it says the libtool.la files are only useful in linking static libraries. So we can remove them basically using this command here. And we can delete any documentation. This is only a temporary system, so it's not really required. Even if, like me, you like to have documentation around, you, you don't really want them in a temporary system. Um, it says all the remaining steps in this section are optional. Nevertheless, as soon as you begin installing packages in Chapter 8, the temporary tools will be overwritten. So it may be a good idea to make a backup of the temporary tools as described below. The other steps are only needed if you're really short on disk space. Um, the following steps are performed outside of the true environment. It means you have to leave the true environment first by, before continuing. And it gives, it gives you the reasons basically in case any of the objects are, are in use while we're in the true environment. And to get access to the file system outside the true environment to create the backup. Leave the true environment and unmount the the kernel virtual file system so because we're going to um, I don't normally do this now um, I used to regularly back up the tools temporary tools um, but I found I was barely ever using them so it seemed a bit pointless but I'm going to go through it anyway just for uh, part of the demonstration um, but yeah what we've got to do when we come out if we leave the virtual file systems mounted then we're effectively backing those up as well which is not what we want so let's do the control D or as as they've got there you can type in exit you can see it says log out so we're not in the truth anymore and we'll unmount everything in dev and the LFS and sys proc and run as well Then it's got three commands to strip any debugging symbols that have been added. So if we have a look at the size of the LFS system, we've got 1.3 gigabytes. Remember that includes sources. So probably roughly about half of that is the source, as a rough guess. So let's run these strip commands and see what effect it has on the disk space removing this debug stuff so yeah already we've lost a hundred megabytes in that one command let's run the second one and as I say it's a temporary system we don't need all this extra stuff um, and another reason is we're archiving it so again we archive unnecessary stuff so that didn't save so much It does say it will, it will strip about 90 megabytes, so maybe we've stripped the majority of it already. Yeah, it, it's roughly, as what they say, 90 meg, 100 megabytes. Um, take care not to strip unneeded on the libraries. Well, if you run these commands, it will be safe. Don't run any others. At this point, you should leave at, have at least 5 gigabytes of space well I've got a 500 gigabyte drive so this should be enough but if we run df-h look for the root partition that the LFS system is being built on you can see available 432 gigabytes so what it's saying as long as that's at least 5 you should be ok oh and it actually gives a command there df-h LFS so now to back up the system so it says to change into the LFS directory and run this command. Now what I found is, yes, this command does the job and it does it perfectly well, except that if you look at the top, you'll see that it's actually only running on one core. We've got four cores available, so it's going to take um, approximately four times as long to to build up. Um, this archive to tar it and uh, compress it with the XZ. 
so what I like to do is to do it in two stages to tar it up as a tar ball and then run XZ um, on its own uh, discreetly um, and turn on the threading option so that we can utilize all the threads of the processor. So it's basically a similar command for the tar. We'll take off the XZ suffix because that will create it when we um, run XZ. Take off the capital J which is the bit that tells tar to invoke XZ compressor. Uh, the P is for permissions to retain permissions on all the files that are, get archived. So let's run that now. Um, in fact what I'll do is I'll turn on the V so we can see the verbose output see that it's actually compressing the files. So this is taking everything that's in the LFS hierarchy and as you can see it's putting it in the home directory which we root so it's putting it in the root directory and it's creating a file called LFS temp tools 10.0.tar Okay, that should be there now. So let's look in the root directory. And yes, you can see it there. I'm just going to delete the other XZ file because that's going to be created anew. So we'll do rm forward slash root forward slash lfs temp tools da, 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 tar dot xz. So get rid of that one. And now we can run the xz command minus z to compress v for verbose. E for extra compression, if you've got time for that, otherwise you can leave that off. T for number of threads, we've got four cores. I believe you can leave a number off of that and it will use all the cores available. I like to specify it um, just so I know what it's doing. But for example, if you're running something else in the background or you want to carry on working, you don't want the system to slow down, you could put, say, use only three threads while it's, uh, while it's compressing. Um, Oh, and I put a 9 in as well for maximum compression. So just go through those options again. Z is compress. V is for B for verbose. It will tell us some stats while it's compressing. E is for extra compression. 9 is the maximum compression. So it goes from 0 to 9. 0 is uncompressed, I believe. Um, I think the default is 5, like the middle of the road. And then T, the capital T, specifies the number of threads we want XZ to work on and we want to compress the file that's in the root directory. So let's time this, see how long this takes. So this may take you know, 10, 20 minutes or so, but um, okay, cannot allocate memory. Okay, four gigs not enough, so let's take the E off and see if that works, no. So let's reduce the number of threads then. Yeah, that's working, I'm gonna put the E back on And hopefully, no, I still can't do it. So, okay. It's because of the limited amount of memory. I can go to two threads. That could be why the LFS book doesn't actually put the uh, separate commands in because of um, the lack of memory. Obviously, you'd need maybe 8 gigabytes to be able to compress on all threads with maximal compression. So, at the moment, it says it's going to take about 9 minutes. It can vary depending on what it finds in the archive. Yeah, it's already gone up to 10 minutes, 11 minutes. Um, but I'll leave that running and come back when it's done.
Okay, so that took 20 minutes in the end. Um, but bear in mind, had we just run this command in the book, it would have taken double that because it would have run a one core. So um, certainly a little bit more efficient for a little bit more effort. So um, yeah, we should have um, an archive in there just over 700 megabytes for the looks of it. Um, yeah, the book actually says at least 600 megabytes free. It looks like the minimum of, should be 700 now, maybe even 800 megabytes. Um, it's obviously got slightly larger since they first published that figure in the book. It's obviously not been updated, so it's worth bearing in mind if you do do LFS in the future that um, it could be a lot larger than 700 megabytes even. Tells you how to restore it there if you need to. Hopefully, you won't need to. Um, or, um, as it might be mentioned, you can use the those tools, that archive, to build on another Raspberry Pi if you so wish. <coughs> so, what we need to do now is to remount the virtual file systems before we go any further um, and then re enter the truth. So, as I said before, it's this command here we need to rerun and each one of these. Now I'm just going to run all of these in. There should be no problem. And shouldn't need to run this again anyway because we've already run it, but if you are a bit paranoid you can run it again. Um, if it was doing anything it's got a verbose option there so it would actually print something up, but as you can see it's not, not done anything so that's fine. And then or the last thing we need to do is to enter the true environment again. Well, we could go to the page to see how to do that, or we should still have the command that we use to enter truth if we just go back. Um, easy way, in fact, to do it is to do control R, type in some letters like truth, and you can see it's picked out. Just make sure it's the one that's got the correct C CXX flags in. It is. So we can press enter. And there we are, back in true. So we can carry on.